everyone. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to uh, the session we have today on precision medicine at your fingertips. And I'll talk a little bit today about how multimodal data is driving personalized care. My name is Louis Coulot. I'm the general manager for genomics and oncology informatics at Philips. So the way I want to begin today is to think a little bit about the complexity around multidisciplinary care. And this is a particular uh, interest in oncology. So if we think about a patient journey from early detection of disease through to precision diagnosis, so we're pulling together data from different diagnostic modalities and different kinds of doctors are actually intersecting with the patient here through treatment selection and then therapy planning and assessment, an entire care team surrounds the patient at each point in this journey and work together. Now, all of these doctors and practitioners are pulling together an enormous amount of information around the patient. And this presents a particular challenge for us in oncology. So if you replace the care team now with the devices that are generating enormous amounts of information along with clinical context for the patient, you get a sense of how complex this really becomes. So if you think about, for example, you know, a lung cancer patient who might begin with uh, early diagnosis through a screening program where they might get a CT image uh, and then progress towards diagnosis and progress towards treatment, we're now bringing in data sources between CT, MR, molecular imaging, pathology data, which now is also being digitized and captured as, as imaging formats, and genomics information, all of this together becomes honestly a very difficult challenge for the care teams themselves as they're thinking about how to best care and treat these patients. So in oncology now, or in any, any uh, medical discipline, this matters because the treatment matters, the intervention matters. So we don't just want data for data's sake, but we want data for what's called actionability. So what action could care team members take based on the information? Now, if each one of these devices or each one of these pictures of the patient is giving us a slightly different view, pulling it together really then drives a, a more integrated view of the patient themselves and leads care teams towards the uh, appropriate therapy options. Now, if you work backwards from the kinds of therapies, you see another kind of problem that we have, which is the explosion in the options for these patients. So as I said earlier, when you think about diagnosing the patient, you think about the molecular profiling of the disease. So as we learn more and more and more about cancer, we're also learning that different cancer is not one disease, but it's many diseases. And even within those diseases, there are subcategories of the diseases. And these are all uncovered through uh, different kinds of diagnostic tests. We often call molecular profiling. These then lead to prognostic markers and potentially therapies. Now, if you look at this chart, this chart is showing us, I think, the other side of the problem, which I, which I was um, alluding to, which is a number of therapy choices that doctors now have at, these, at their fingertips. So if you go back to 2009, there were eight drugs approved in oncology. In 2020, there were 57 new drugs and indications that were approved in oncology. And these are, of course, all cumulative. So though some of these are existing drugs that are using new indications, some of these are new mechanisms, some are for entirely new cancer subtypes, but in general, there are now literally hundreds of possible therapies or therapy combinations which can be used to treat cancer. In addition to this, there are about 1,500 clinical trials that are currently open. And that has also been a quadrupling in that number in the last two decades. So we have this double challenge, right? How do we pull together all of this data to get a better picture of the patient? And then with that view, what does it all mean in terms of best course of treatment and treatment options? So this is the problem space that we're trying to address when we think about pulling together, pulling together this data and making sense of it. Now, let me bring in the, the sort of third chapter to this, right? So we have lots of data around these patients, imaging data, molecular data, pathology data that tell us more and more about the disease biology. We have a large number of therapy options and choices in clinical trials that could potentially be available for these patients. And then we have the practitioner, the, the, the clinician who has an incredibly busy schedule is treating lots of patients and they're trying to make sense of all this information, right? So making it not just um, manageable, but understandable and actionable by the doctors is also another challenge. So this actually was, was a survey that was done uh, fairly recently and in this case, NGS, by the way, stands for next generation sequencing. So these doctors were actually looking at the results from these genomic tests. And in the survey, more than half, now these are oncologists, more than half of the oncologists 
reported that the test results were difficult to interpret, either often or sometimes. A quarter of them said that they actually referred patients to other providers for testing, which might suggest in a lack of expertise or comfort in just un understanding and how to order these tests. So we have this incredibly sophisticated technology in terms of, of, of understanding disease biology. We have a huge uh, number of options that are available to patients in terms of both therapies and trials. And then we have doctors who are trying to make sense of all this together. So one of the things that we were trying to solve here is how do we, how do we bring this all together and how do we make it more meaningful and, and usable uh, by the doctors? And so this led us uh, in partnership with uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, one of the leading cancer uh, centers in the world. And it was an initiative led by Dr. Kenneth Shaw. And this was a system that they had developed in-house expressly for this purpose. Now, we haven't talked at all about how we use technology to make this all accessible, but th this, this is kind of the linchpin. So what they developed at MD Anderson is, is a system in-house where they had teams of scientists and experts who look at the literature, understand the biology, understand what's being uncovered almost on a daily basis, and then make this useful for the treating clinicians. There are a few aspects to this, but in addition to being able to store and process the results, they also make sure they're interpreted and matched to relevant literature. And this is the evidence that underpins what we call evidence-based medicine. So we're not trying to have a machine to decide anything, but it becomes a, looks like a super sophisticated machine because the, the rules, the expert guidance that was developed at MD Anderson is now embodied. And so what we've done here at, at, at Philips in partnership with AWS is to take this combination, this combination of data that's being thrown at us, the complexity of interpreting it and making it useful and taking that expertise and then being and virtualizing it for the world. So now anybody can access this. If you put the data in the system and you have the right data behind it, you can then activate these rules and these databases that were built by MD Anderson and make them useful and make this, this incredibly complex data rich and understandable uh, to doctors and quickly actionable. So if you look at the end-to-end -end flow here, and this again, I think I'll touch both on, on AWS and what we've built uh, at Philips in terms of what we call HealthSuite platform. We really are going you know, end-to-end -end from, I'd say, early detection through assessment and follow-up. But right now I'm zeroing in on this middle area here where, where the molecular pathologist, the diagnostician and the medical oncologist who's treating the patient really kind of intersect around the patient and around the data to make it useful. And so on the back end, you need things like cloud computing to do the genomic uh, um, uh, data processing. You have enormous amounts of data to store and to integrate and make accessible to the doctors. There's also this complexity of how do we actually virtualize this expertise? I mentioned earlier that there are these uh, teams of scientists at MD Anderson that are working on the system, that are curating the literature, that are refining the rules that embody the disease biology and working on these cases, right? So we want them to be able to work and interact with the system in a way and make that generally available, but we have to respect all the rules around patient privacy, even the provider's privacy, uh, compliance you know, with, with things like HIPAA and data security. So we've created basically with AWS what I would call an asymmetric multi-tenant system. So you've got slices of the data that are coming from the healthcare institute that are really built on the ground that are then acquired delivered in a cloud environment, and then interact with this expert system that was built with MD Anderson to then return those results back to the ordering clinician. So this is a really kind of unique um, use case here. It's a lot of moving data around, but I think it moves it around in a way that makes it, you know, what was really honestly a very complex problem, really addressable uh, and actionable for the doctors. So let me just give you a, a real use case about why this is, needs to be what I would call a real-time system or a quasi-real-time system. So this uh, is called PIK3CA. That's actually a gene. It's a, it's a gene, well, a particular um, tumor-driving gene. And that N1044K is a particular mutation, right? So as you know from cancer biology, uh, cancer is you know, a disease of the genome and cancer patients have these mutations that drive the disease. And increasingly, we can now target those drivers uh, and, and treat the disease from its disease biology. So now this has to be understood and research has to go into understanding what all these different mutations mean. And if you look on the right, you can see the evolution. So from July 1st, 2015 to February 23rd, 2017, you know, is a very short period of time. We're talking about 
roughly 19 months between these two um, uh, data points. And the first, that FS means functional significance. So it was just unknown. People saw these mutations occurring, the sort of occurring in cancer, but they didn't know what they meant. Then suddenly on February 23rd, 2017, there's research done, there's now evidence that says this is an activating mutation. There's actionability associated with it. You can do something for these patients. So one, that information needs to be captured, like I said, as quickly as possible and made available on the platform for patients who are newly di diagnosed. But because this information is available on the platform, you can also go look at historical patients. Maybe I had a patient who was in last week or last month who had gene sequencing done and had this mutation. And a month ago, we didn't know anything about it, but now we do. Now there's a clinical trial or now there's a therapy available. So making these systems accessible and dynamic is also only possible when you have this distributed computing environment that's made possible through uh, Philips and AWS. So this brought us again to our partnership with MD Anderson. And it was important for us to really think about, well, why did MD Anderson build this for themselves? Before we got involved as Philips and made this available to others, what was the problem that MD Anderson was trying to solve with the Precision Oncology Decision Support System? And this again was through my conversations with Dr. Kenneth Shaw. And she said, look, this had a singular purpose, which was to address this issue, to provide our clinicians with information in real time, or I'd say quasi real time on mutations, whether they're actionable and what available clinical trials are matching those actionable mutations. So of course this goes through the literature, it looks at therapy response, also looks at resistance to therapy. There are actually mutations in cancer that will predict the patient won't respond to certain therapies. They look at the, um, uh, the clinical trials, the investigational therapies, is there eligible el eligibility criteria associated with those patients based on their genotype? And this was the whole point of it, right? So they created this for their use to really get it, those 50% of the doctors in that survey to make this data more accessible. And so we built this out, we incorporated it in, in, as Philips as part of our genomics workspace, which does some things you might expect like clinical reporting from sequencers and, and um, uh, analytics, but I think one of the key things here too is enabling these molecular and multidisciplinary tumor board meetings because genomics again is part of the data. So when you think about a multidisciplinary meeting, you need to understand the, the genomics, you need to understand the disease and the therapy options that are available because of that, but also what's happening with the patient. Are they progressing? You're looking at radiology data to see if a patient and maybe a tumor is growing or there's metastases. Looking at the pathology data, which now again is increasingly digital and then learning from every patient. So based on what we've seen before and based on the decisions we've made, this is for the health systems themselves to understand what's happening with their patient population. What are the analytics around it? What kinds of patients are we seeing? So this is also captured on the back end of this. Uh, now, the last point, which I'll make here, and I think this is a really critical one, is any system like this, no matter how beautifully designed and elegant and deployed, has to be integrated with the healthcare systems informatics landscape, which typically means the electronic medical record and potentially lab information system or radiology information system or other IT systems that the care teams are interacting with. If it's accessible, if it's interoperable, and if it works with those systems, it'll get used. If it's a standalone thing, you know, care teams are incredibly busy, doctors are incredibly busy. As valuable as these things can be, they really don't achieve their full potential unless they're integrated with that landscape. So this means having a connection between, I call it cloud to ground. So these beautiful systems running in the cloud backbones powered by AWS, but then they have to be integrated in the IT landscape of the healthcare system. So what does it look like in practice? Again, this is sort of a view of looking at some genomics data uh, and actionability. And these are interactive uh, dashboards that you know clinicians can, can uh, use to to kind of sift through all the information. But here again, also we are integrating radiology data, pathology data, anything that we can to help paint the full picture of the, as full a picture as we can of that patient. So I get asked the question, why would we build this in the cloud? And I think it's not really quite the right question. I don't think this could be built outside of a cloud backbone 
and as a software, as a service. And the reason is, I think, a few fold. One is the compute and storage requirements really just lend themselves to cloud computing and backbone. And so AWS provides us with this, right? So we have access to things like Elastic Compute, which are really essential for things like genomics files uh, and being able to process these things. They're, they kind of are lumpy in terms of the demand for them. You know, sometimes there's a lot of tests that are being processed at once. Sometimes there's a, there's a low period. So having access to things like, you know, Elastic Computing is really essential for this. Also storage, right? So these are huge files. Um, and being able to store them cost effectively, being able to use things like archive layers like Glacier uh, and Deep Glacier to manage data files that you want to keep, but you really don't need to access along with things that are high availability. This all really lends itself to a, a cloud-based environment and be very inefficient to do it otherwise. But then when we get to the other use cases, it has to be cloud. So if I think about the multi-tenant use case, I mentioned earlier this combination I call hybrid multi-tenant. So you have a institution who's using the system, who's interacting it with their data, their patient information. So this is all HIPAA compliant and high trust certified. And so you have um, all the data privacy around patients, also around the providers, they're all de-identified, but you're, um, interop you're interoperating with the system for your institution. But then on the back end, you're connecting with another institution. In this case, I mentioned MD Anderson to help curate cases or help annotate cases, right? So they can't see by law all the data around your patient. They can only see what they need to see in order to do their job. So having this, what I call hybrid multi-tenant where you're asymmetrically sharing data between tenants to do the job of the care team or help augment the job of the care team is again, really only possible with, with these kinds of uh, cloud-based models. And then lastly, the power around analytics and data sharing. Now, we started earlier talking about how as scientists and clinicians are understanding more and more about cancer, um, we're actually creating another problem. So people talk about, about cancer as a big data problem, and I think that's true, but it's also what I call a small end problem. And what I mean by that is if you take something like, take lung cancer, right? So you see lung cancer, you take, okay, now stage, certain stage of disease. So my stage four lung cancer uh, cases that have certain mutations that have another characteristic. So you wind up subsetting and subsetting and subsetting these populations so that even the biggest healthcare institutions sometimes only have a few patients that fit the criteria that we're trying to learn from. So to be able to combine data, again, de-identified and in a compliant way, but combine data so we can learn from it is again, really enabled through these uh, cloud-based uh, ecosystems such as we have with, with AWS. So. That's why this has to be built in the cloud. I wanna thank you again uh, for your time today. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank uh, AWS and my colleagues here at Philips who helped us build this and wish you a good day.